Every year, thousands of people die without leaving a will. If no relatives come forward, then their estates will go to the government. Keeping this money in the family is a job for the air hunters. On today's programme, the air hunters face their toughest competition yet. Who's that? Thank you very much. As they race to be the first to sign up heirs to a possible £200,000 fortune. Well, I'll tell you, a very close call. Fraser & Fraser is one of the oldest firms of air hunters in Britain. It's owned by Andrew, Charles and Neil Fraser. They run a team of case managers and researchers in the office as well as a squadron of travelling air hunters who are based all over the country and are ready to go wherever the hunt takes them. It's 7am on Thursday morning at Fraser & Fraser's central London office. The Treasury has just released its list of unclaimed estates and Neil Fraser is poring over it trying to identify the high-value cases. This morning, it looks like he's in luck. I think the main case we're going to look at today uh, is this Ethel Clemson. Um, dies in 2008, uh, December of 2008. Now, it doesn't look like she owned a property when she passed away, but what I have been able to find out is the house that she was living in was sold on the 4th of December. Now, to me, that sort of indicates that the property has been sold as she's moved into a nursing home. Ethel died aged 88, six months after moving into this nursing home in East London. The property that Neil believes she sold just before her death was in Leytonstone. He estimates the house could have been sold for around £200,000. As Ethel was only in the home for a short while, he hopes that'll mean there's a lot of money left over for the estate. I think we're going to work that quite quickly and probably get quite a lot of staff on. The surname Plimson sounds very good. I think it's going to be quite an easy name to work. Could you just start working on Therefore, I suspect that we're going to fill out the family tree very, very quickly, but probably get an awful lot of competition. So, fingers crossed, we can, uh, we can get to everyone before the opposition does. If the estate is going to be worth at least £200,000, then the company could be in line to make good commission. Clipson is an unusual name which will stand out in the records and be easy to trace. So Neil's going to focus all his efforts on investigating this side of the family first. It's a risk, but he hopes it'll pay off. Good morning. I'm, so, I'm sorry to trouble you so early in the morning. I'm making some inquiries... Air hunter David Slee immediately takes charge of the case. He's already found a number for a neighbour of Ethel's in Leytonstone. N not aware of the person at all. No, I'm very sorry to have troubled you. Thank you for, thank you for your time. Bye-bye. If they don't have any joy on the phone, the next step is to send someone round to see what they can find out on the ground. Dave Headley. Between them, Neil and Dave assign a senior researcher out on the road to the case. But no joy there either. Dave Hadley's on answer phone. Well, why do I think it's going to be one of those days? David's frustrated because he knows that the first few minutes of any investigation can make or break a case, especially when there could be as much as £200,000 at stake. Whether or not Ethel left a lot of money after her death, for the last years of her life, she lived modestly in this terraced house in East London. Elaine was her good friend and carer until just before the end, and she always knew Ethel as Peggy. Everybody who knew Peggy liked her. She was a very bright, happy, fun-loving person. I kept in touch with her 30-odd years, so I would say it's a lifelong friendship. Ethel and Elaine met in 1975, when they were both working in the accounts department of Heels Furniture Store in London. Heels was a very posh place to work in. When I say people were working, they say, oh, you work in Heels? You know, so like that. It was because it was um, a very posh place to work in. Anybody's birthday or anyone's getting married or Christmas, you know, it was a party. And we all enjoyed it together. And it was fun. 
and she stayed there until she retired, so she must have loved it, you know. The friends that Ethel made at Heels became like family and were a great support and comfort to her. Although she never married, Ethel did have one great love in her life. We asked her about her personal life. She said her fiancé went in the war, in the Second World War, and he didn't come back. John was Ethel's fiancé, but like many women at that time, her romantic hopes were dashed by the war. Losing him so young, at what should have been the beginning of their lives together, was something she found very hard to get over. We did ask her such questions. Peggy, are you, are you going to get married again? She said, no, girls, we're not going to get married again. I don't want to, you know. She said, John's gone and I don't want anyone else. She never met another man or had a family, but that didn't stop her enjoying life. Ethel loved to travel, and long after her retirement, she was still enjoying girls' trips abroad with her friends from Heels. Peggy was never a sad person, <laughs> no, never. <laughs> Too much personality for that. It's still only 7.30 a.m., but case manager David Slee and his team have already made good progress. They've been able to access Ethel's death certificate online. So from that, Debbie and Joe have already found her birth certificate and started building out her family tree. So she's an only child? Yeah. Yeah, I thought so. With no siblings or children of her own, the team now know they will need to look further back to her grandparents, uncles, aunts and cousins to find any heirs. Ethel's grandparents were John Henry Climpson and Sarah Stamford. They had six children, Ethel's father George being the eldest, and five others, one of whom died in infancy. We're making sure that we've got top-line births done manually. Ethel's aunts and uncles will form the top line of her family tree, and it's likely to be their descendants, her cousins, who are heirs. So Dave wants to be sure that he's got the right details for them. There can be gaps on these websites, and we have our own manual records that we can go through, and although it takes a bit longer, it allows us to be a lot more thorough and a lot more certain about our research. It's not long before this meticulous approach to their research pays off. George Frederick D. has got to be here. David has found a birth record for a George Frederick, son of Ethel's aunt, Bertha Climpson. George died in 1996, but they also uncover a record for his sister, June, and here they hit the jackpot. We've got a current address for a paternal first cousin living in Woodford Green, so not far from where the deceased lived. It's absolutely falling out so easy, too easy. This is great news for the team. It's still only 8 a.m. and they have already located Ethel's first cousin and their first living heir, June. But for all they know, the competition could be there already. So Dave gets straight on to Dave Hadley. Dave, it's Dave Slee. Can you go Woodford Green? OK. We've been addressed for a paternal first cousin. Thanks now. Bye-bye. The team have found one heir in record time, but Dave can't afford to rest on his laurels. There are still four more of Ethel's paternal aunts and uncles to investigate. It's not long before the next breakthrough. We've just been able to identify the death of the deceased paternal uncle, Frederick William Clemson. Frederick was Ethel's youngest uncle who died in 1980 in Devon, in Essex. The air hunters need to discover if he had any children. Very soon, researcher Debbie makes a very interesting discovery. Yeah. That's stuff for this marriage, yeah, Frederick's. Like the marrying March 26th. More paper. More paper. <laughs> <laughs> of the marriage of um, Frederick, there is a possibility of um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine children. Um, yeah. Nine children means nine more leads for the air hunters to follow up. This search is only just getting going. It's been a mad half hour, hour or so. The tree has just ballooned out. Uh, I think we're finding stuff quicker than Dave could write it on the tree. It's too easy. 
a lot of competition on this as we, we thought we were going to have. So, fingers crossed, they'll, they'll go with Fraser's. Their rivals may be snapping at their heels, but for the moment, there's no stopping the air hunters. They found six more of Ethel's first cousins and heirs. Her uncle, Frederick Klimpson, had nine children. Three died, but the rest are alive and well and all living in the same area. Ipswich, all Suffolk addresses. Yep, Ipswich is coming out here as well. Hopefully we'll be able to contact someone. I think all we need is some yep. phone calls on this. Yeah, I agree with you now. Air hunter David Pacifico joins the team. This case is expanding so fast that they need another case manager just to keep pace with developments. With the competition breathing down their necks, the two Davids make some preemptive phone calls to the heirs they've identified in Ipswich. What I wonder if, if, if it's possible, sir, is if, if I can have one of my representatives uh, come and see you today and explain... David Slee gets through to Ethel's cousin, Brian, and he's desperate to get Fraser's foot in the door. So, if you wouldn't mind, even if another company does approach you, let my chap have a word with you as well. It's still only 8.45, and Dave Hadley has already arrived in Woodford Green, at the address he's been given for Ethel's cousin, June. Sorry to trouble you so early without an appointment. I actually wanted to speak to your wife, June, if that's possible. Oh, right, OK. Can I make an appointment to see her today? Would that be possible? Yes. That would be fantastic. Thank you. Bye-bye. Hi, Dave. I've confirmed that the lady does live there. She's in bed at the moment. Um, so I've made an appointment to interview her in an hour's time. One hour. OK, I need... I, I'm also trying to get you to, for some interviews in Ipswich. This is a setback they didn't need. With airs lined up ready to be interviewed, time is of the essence. I'm just going to have to sit here patiently for the next hour until... Mrs. Brown is ready to see me. Rather than give ground to the competition, David Pacifico decides he needs even more manpower on the case. Ethel Clemson, daughter of George Charles. Clemson. He brings senior researcher on the road, Hewitt Lindsay, up to speed. Right, do you want to head to Ipswich? Hi, oh, Dave. Right. Speak to you later. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, bye. Bye. God, it's all manic, isn't it? It's all go. It will be at least an hour and a half before Ewart can get to Ipswich. But back in the office, a whole new team of air hunters have started researching Ethel's mother's family, the Norrises. They're headed up by David number three, David Milchard, a.k.a. Grimble. Hold on. Joe, are you still doing this, sorry? Yeah, I'm doing Norris, sir. They know that Ethel's mother was born in West Ham in London, but unlike Klimpson, Norris has not been such an easy name to research. Norris is not a bad name. I mean, it's not Smith or James or anything like that. But there are quite a lot of them, and we've got at least two of everything in West Ham. So we can't say, oh, it's that one, and move on. While the maternal team carry on their investigations in the office, over in Woodford Green, Dave Hadley's hour of waiting is over. Hello, is it convenient? Thank you very much. Thank you. He's finally getting to speak to June and her husband, Gordon. Fraser's have invested a lot in this case, so Dave needs this interview to be a success. Well, we... I won't disclose who the person is that's died at the moment, because we, we have to protect our interests, and until we've got an agreement from the client that they're prepared for us to, to deal with it, then... But once we've got that, then we'll, we'll give full disclosure. But what I can tell you... <laughs> A knock on the door reveals the competition has finally caught up with them. Coming up on the show, the race is now on to sign up airs, and Fraser and Fraser's rivals are closing in. Who's that? But having come so far, will the air hunters end up losing it all? Fraser and Fraser have been investigating the case of 88-year-old Ethel Clemson, who died in test date, leaving what Neil Fraser hoped will be a £200,000 estate. 
What I have been able to find out is the house that she was living in was sold on the 4th of December. To me, that sort of indicates that the property has been sold as she's moved into a nursing home. If their hunch is correct and she did own her home in Leytonstone before it was sold, then her estate could be worth several hundred thousand pounds. The possibility of a huge payout has attracted a lot of competition from rival companies, and the hunt for heirs has been fast and furious. In only a couple of hours, Fraser's managed to trace the first of Ethel's many heirs. But just then, the competition came knocking. Fortunately for heir hunter Dave Hadley, June sticks to her guns and hears him out. You're going to get a few companies contacting you, I tell you now. Really? There's about four or five of us, um, and we compete against one another. Oh, and that's why I was so keen to that's speak great. to your wife really? this morning <laughs> rather than this yes. afternoon. Yes. Yeah. Oh, how yeah. strange. Yeah. <laughs> so your mother was Bertha, wasn't she? Bertha Climpson. Dave gets on with interviewing June, and at the same time, confirms some of the details of her family tree. And the younger brother, I can remember my mother said he moved down into Essex um, and they didn't, you know, of course those days they didn't have a lot of contact. I right. suppose there wasn't phones and no. things like that. No. You know, that's as far as my memory takes me but back. But you've lost contact with them, presumably. I never knew him. I never knew of any of her brothers. June's uncle, Frederick Climpson, lost contact with her mother, Bertha, when he moved away from London. So he never met June or her brother George. But his children and grandchildren are now living in Ipswich in Suffolk. And as they speak, an air hunter is on his way to interview them. Right, well, thanks ever so much. Right. Lovely nice meeting you. Bye-bye. I uh, hope you get on in your quest. Thank you. Bye. The money side doesn't, to be honest, bother me too much. Um, but uh, it's, it would be interesting to see the family tree and the, uh, the relatives and maybe have some contact with them uh, because all, all my life I've never known them. Whilst I was there, somebody knocked on the door, yeah. left their card, but I think we're pretty secure on this one. She's, she's not going to go back on this one. No, lovely. Thanks, mate. Bye-bye. Competition is particularly fierce. Um, I know of at least two other companies. I think there's probably uh, a third, maybe even a fourth company working on this case as well. But we're certainly ahead of the uh, majority of the competition. As the uh, next hour, two hours develops, we'll be able to see exactly where we are. At last, Ewart arrives in Suffolk for his interview with Hazel. Hello, this is Terry. The granddaughter of Ethel's uncle, Frederick. Okay, just confirm your full name for me. With her husband Bernard looking on, the interview has only just got going when all of a sudden they're interrupted. Who's that? Pass. Sir? Sorry. Uh, that's the other company. Must say. Yeah. Uh, so I had a phone call this morning. Once again, one of their competitors is on the doorstep. But Heather's already made up her mind to go with Fraser's. Last week, you take it. All the best. Ewart has won the day, but only just. Well, I tell you, a very close call. Luckily, the heir's husband literally just told the guy to go away. He's not interested. Job well done to me. Things are going well in Suffolk, but back in London, they're still having problems confirming the maternal side of Ethel's family tree. Ethel's grandparents were John Norris and Anne McAvoy. Her mother, also called Ethel, was one of eight children, amongst whom was a boy called Leonard. The team have found records of a Leonard Norris, who they think could be Ethel's youngest brother. Through him, they found several living relatives who could be Ethel's heirs. However, they need proof that this Leonard Norris has the same parents as Ethel, so they've sent senior researcher Bob Smith to look for his marriage certificate. Yep, that's right. Leonard Norris, son of John Norris. Okay, hi, Bob. Hi, mate. Yeah, I got the marriage. It looks right. Bob phones in the good news to the office, and they give him his new instructions. I now have to move on very quickly to Milton Keynes to see uh, Wendy Smith, uh, who we know, now know is definitely related to our deceased. 
Leonard Norris and his wife Charlotte had three children. Their son, also called Leonard, married Elsie and had one daughter, Wendy, Ethel's first cousin once removed. So Bob now becomes travelling air hunter number three to hit the road in search of heirs to Ethel's estate, which could be worth up to £250,000. Our decision, I think, to have three travellers, um, the three Daves case managing, and all the, the researchers downstairs is starting to pay off now because we really have swamped it with resource, swamped it with people, and that's why we're ahead of all, all of our competition. For Dave Milchard and the team in the office, it's definitely been a good day's work. So it looks like we're finna at the moment. No more to do until tomorrow. But for the travelling air hunters on the road, the day is a long way from being over. Hewitt is still working his way through his list of heirs on the paternal Clemson side of the family. Hello, Mr. Hello. Smith. Hello. Yes. I'm Robert from Hello. Fraser and Fraser. While in Milton Keynes, Bob finally arrives at Wendy Smith's house, a cousin of Ethel's on her maternal side. How many children from your parents' marriage? Just me. Just your only yeah. child. Yeah. That will certainly help you. You inherit your father's share. So if there were any other children, obviously... Right to split. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right. <laughs> no wonder Wendy's pleased. She could be in line to receive around £20,000. It's early morning on Friday, and some shocking news has come through to Fraser's central London office concerning Ethel's old home in Leytonstone. Air hunter David Pacifico is in a sombre mood as he puts in a call to Ewart. It's likely to be a low-value case now. Oh, is it? Yeah. How much? Don't know, but she didn't own the property. Oh, God. Unfortunately, but there you are. It turns out that Ethel rented rather than owned her home, so her estate didn't benefit from its sale after all. I'm just a bit cheesed off. <laughs> no, I don't blame you. I feel the same, yeah. We've gone back over and checked a few things, and it, it looks as though our initial estimate on the valuation of the case may have been um, slightly too high may not be the £200,000 we thought of, it could be even down to £5,000, which uh, is, is, is a harsh reality for us if, if that is the case, because we've had so many people working on it. It's a massive disappointment for the air hunters, but for the heirs themselves, there is definitely a silver lining to this cloud. Let's put it this way, we've achieved something on this case, we're putting people back in contact. Yeah. Now we should be pleased about that. When she was first contacted by Fraser and Fraser, June wasn't even sure that she had any living relatives on her mother's side. A couple of weeks later, and air hunter David Pacifico has been in touch with some exciting news. I said to him, am I the only first cousin? And he said, no, because there is this uncle up in Suffolk that had nine children. Well, that was a surprise. <laughs> in one phone call, <laughs> it altered things quite dramatically. June's uncle Frederick moved from London to Suffolk and had nine children, of which six are still alive. They're all Ethel's heirs and all completely unaware that they had a cousin. That was a real shock because I just thought there was a, my only, only my brothers and sisters. Never dreamt. There was anybody else. Thank you very much. My dad never discussed his family with us, so we just had no idea. Hello, hello June. Hello, hello you're, you're Jean. I'm Jean, yeah. Oh, how lovely to meet you. Yeah. Come in. <laughs> well, <Yeah>. Wow. <laughs> this, this is a number to meet. This is, well, this is my oldest brother, Ron. How do you do, Ron? Ron? Sister Pat. Right. So, you were Clipsons. We were all, well, you were all Clipsons. Clipsons. Yeah. That yeah. is amazing. <laughs> lovely. You've got photographs. <laughs> and so have I. Oh, I'll have to get all this. <laughs> no, that's our dad and mum. Really? So that was... That's Fred. That Frederick. was Frederick. Oh, this is wonderful. That, that... <laughs> 
quite elated, <laughs> quite elated. It, it's really lovely seeing all these people. When June walked through the door, it was excitement, trepidation, because you didn't know what we were going to find out about my dad's family. So that's yeah. aunt, your Aunt Bertha. So that's Dad's sister. Yes, yeah. that's your Now you can see the likeness. Yes, I, I think can. you can. Yep. I shall have to compare it. Oh, yes. yes. Definitely. Definitely saw resemblance in the photographs of my father and June's mother. It was very much alike, I thought. That, that was my grandma which would have been, well, it would have been your grandma, wouldn't it? Yeah, 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 of, course yeah, it would. yeah. of course it would. Ethel may not have left a large estate, but her actual legacy is much more important. Because of her, a scattered family has been brought together and they couldn't be more delighted. Oh, it's been a fantastic event, really, because I don't think it would have come about had this have not have happened. We've now found out about what we never knew anything about. Now, this is the older brother. This is Henry, but Henry always so known as Uncle Harry. Yeah. yeah, he was my mother's favourite. <laughs> I'm pleased that I've been able to fill in a few gaps for them because I think they've been more in the dark than I've been. We, yeah, we don't know nothing, nothing, nothing at all. Oh, I'm quite a <laughs> revelation. <laughs> <laughs> it's given me great pleasure. If you would like to find out more about how to build a family tree or write a will, go to bbc.co.uk.